Welcome back to Think Tech. Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel uh, here on Community Matters, and we're talking today about um, another virus. Uh, it could be that we have two viruses in this country. We're going to talk about that with, with Kenneth Lawson. He's a professor of criminal law at UH Manoa, William S. Richardson School of Law. Uh, welcome to the show, Ken. Nice to have you here. Thanks for having me, Jay. So let's examine, um, you know, the, the problem in this country that uh, erupted in the uh, George Floyd case um, and that we saw in, in such stark and surprising detail. Uh, and then let's talk about uh, the protests that followed. You have covered this kind of thing through your career, your life. And I wonder if you'd give us a handle on what is going on out there. I think it's... Um as you and I were talking before the show, you know, I've been involved in these types of protests because they affect, they affect me personally. They affect a lot of black people personally. Uh, having seen my father being uh, dragged out of an automobile and slammed to the ground. Uh, and so when I, um, so I, you know, I started protesting at an early age and I became an attorney. Then I started doing uh, criminal law and civil rights law in Cincinnati, Ohio. And so I used to represent families, uh, much like what we see um, with um, um, some of the other attorneys that represent um, Black people being killed by the police or in police custody. And I would do those civil lawsuits. And so uh, in Cincinnati in 2001, um, I represented the 15th um, Black male that had been unarmed, that had been killed by the Cincinnati police in a two-year two period of time. And the city just uh, erupted. I mean, it just erupted. It was almost, it was um, as if enough is enough. And I think what we're seeing here, at least what I'm feeling, um, and it's just been so hard to concentrate, so hard. Um, it, it, you know, we, we saw a few weeks ago where um, Brother Ahmoud Aubrey in Georgia, jogging, was ran down by uh, three white men on a, sunny day in Georgia, like he was a runaway slave and killed. Uh, on, and then the videotape um, was leaked out months later. Had it not been leaked out, they were going to cover this up. Law enforcement was aware of it, but never charged individuals. Then we saw uh, um, a young lady that's an EMT operator in Louisville, who the uh, police in Louisville kicked in her door, executing a, a no-knock search warrant that had been based on uh, faulty information. And her and her boyfriend, who both had no record, they weren't the suspects or anything, uh, were subjected to police shooting at them, and she ended up being killed. And then, you know, no one was charged in that. Then we saw, you know, before um, this happened with, with Mr. Floyd, uh, a man in Central Park bird watching. And, and a white lady calls on the phone, and, and he's videotaping her, and everybody can see that, that he's not threatening her. And she's saying, she's calling the police saying, help come here quick, there's an African-American male threatening me. Now, you know, and, and the reason why that's dangerous is because a lot of police, if they would have came rushing to Central Park, thinking that a black man is attacking a white woman, um, you know, it, he could have been killed. I and, mean, you know, you, you're old enough to remember Susan Smith who, who, who drowned her kids and said that a black guy had done it when she, you know, and so all these things. And so then to see George Floyd, George Floyd. Now, George Floyd, uh, um, that was his name. The, 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 the man that was killed is George Floyd. And, and to see Mr. Floyd being arrested in the prone position and to see that officer with his knee on his neck for almost nine minutes and people saying, get off of him, he's, he's dying. And they hear him scream out, mama. It was like watching a modern day lynching. And I don't think, um, and when, when we see that, and it's, I'm sorry, Jay, when we see that, we know it can happen to us. And so we sit back and we wonder, in 2020, why are we still seeing things that, that in the 50s, 60s, you know, that, that Dr. King and others have fought for. Why are we still seeing the same thing happen 
over and over again, you know? Um, and so I think that all that, at least for me, and I, and you know, no one can speak for the entire black community, but you know, it, for me, I know, and, and I believe the black community feels the same thing. It was just like, this is it. This is, you know, because after that happened and then they didn't charge him and it was clear to everybody, it was just plain murder. And, and you know, when you hear him say, I can't breathe, mama, and, and, and the echoes of Eric Garner is coming in, in you know, and, and same thing in New York City, I can't breathe. And what a lot of people don't understand is, see, when I started these, doing these cases in the mid nineties, one of my first cases involved a man that was placed similar build. His name was Daryl Price. And he was built like Mr. Floyd and he was killed like Mr. Floyd. But back then, police departments really didn't understand the dangers of a positional asphyxiation. And so a lot of them didn't have policies that when you put somebody in the prone position, in other words, when you lay them flat on their stomach, like with Eric Garner, he was, he was, you know, obese. And so when you put somebody's heavy set down, they're really, really in danger of dying because their diaphragm, they can't breathe in and out. If you lay down on a hard surface, even if you're not obese, if you just lay down on your stomach, it's just hard to breathe. And when somebody's pressing down on you, you can breathe out. So you'll say, I can't breathe, help, and all that. And the air is going out, but there's nothing coming back in. And eventually... It, it turns off the oxygen to your brain and then it generates the heart attack. Um, and so that's the position of fixes. So now we know from, from the mid nineties and this, these things were happening a lot. Police are trained that once you get somebody in that position and you, and if you have to put them down there, once you have them secured and handcuffed, you immediately roll them over. And so, you know, I had the, the probable cause report. So Officer Chauvin got arrested, the one that had his knee on the neck of Mr. Floyd that we saw in the video. And so I was able to get a copy of the arrest report that was used for him um, and uh, to give probable cause on why he should be arrested for third degree murder. That's, that's how it's defined in, in Minnesota. And but what, and I'm not gonna go through the whole report, but what 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 they had on body cams. And so they're talking to each other. They being the police, there are three officers. One is has his knee on the neck. The other two, uh, one has is putting pressure on the back of Mr. Floyd while Mr. Floyd's laying down. The other part, the third officer is on his holding his legs down. Um, and so the one officer that's holding his legs down, after a while, when, when Mr. Floyd is saying I can't breathe, the officer turns to Officer Chauvin, the one that got arrested and says, should we roll him over? I'm concerned about excited delirium. That's a condition that can cause, that can happen when you're in that prone position. And Chauvin tells him, and they got this from his body count, no, we're gonna leave him where he's at. And they continue to keep, he continued to keep his knee on his neck for, for several other minutes. Then they checked for a pulse with, um, after six minutes. And the, and the officer that was in the middle, checked for a pulse of Mr. Floyd, and he told Officer Chauvin, well, you can hear it on the body cam, that he, I don't get a pulse. And, he's, and, and, and at that point, he's not breathing. Chauvin, for the next two minutes and 53 seconds, continues to keep his knee on his neck. After being told he has no pulse and he's not breathing, and so, you know, when, when you see that and you see that, that no one's charged uh, and the other two still haven't been charged. And I know, and see what they, and the reason why a lot of communities are upset is because if you went out and committed a crime on videotape, they're not going to say, we're going to investigate. Let's, we want to do the investigation. We want to do a thorough investigation. And Jay, we'll come back and get you later. No, you get taken to jail right now. You're charged with a crime. And then the investigation continues. And so when they kept saying, Things like, you know, you know we're gonna, we want to do a thorough investigation before we make the arrest and stuff like that. Um, you know, a lot of people know that that's just BS. That's just BS. So um, I think we're seeing um, a combination of stuff. But, but real quick, if you watch that videotape and you hear the people that, that are standing around saying to him, him being Chauvin, you're killing him, let him up the look on his face when he's looking back into the video camera is one of arrogance. 
he's, he has his hands in his pockets, his knee on Mr. Floyd's neck, and, and, and Mr. Floyd's not breathing, and, and he's looking into the camera, he being showing with his knee on his neck, it's almost like, you know, I'm going to sit here and do what I want to do no matter what y'all say. That's the impression I get from looking at it. Uh, no concern whatsoever for human life. And that look right there, that arrogance, I think that that really helped to inflame a lot of people. Oh, yeah. Well, so why, why did the police get to this point? It sounds to me, correct me if I'm wrong, but this has been happening a lot. In fact, even on an increasing basis in our lifetimes, um, the number of incidents, the number of people. Um, and, and you wonder what goes through um, the police force as to have somebody like this and allow him to operate this way. Um, what is happening to our police? What is happening to the relationship of the police and the community? Have you got a handle on that? Well, let me just say this. You know, I, I was telling somebody yesterday, you know, when, when we hear the saying, I'm lucky or we're lucky we live in Hawaii, we are. Now, you know me well enough, Jay, you, you know, you, you've been knowing me for a few years. So I'm critical of police misconduct. But I will say this. Uh, we, what we see going on in on the mainland uh, would not be happening here. And, and, and every now and then you may get a death in custody. But, but I think even then, I think what makes Hawaii different for me is that the police officers live in the community. They've been raised in these communities. They, live, they got relatives in the community. They love their communities, right? And so they're part of it. Um, and so there's a caring there. Um, in the mainland, like in Cincinnati, where I practice at and I did cases in Louisville, I did cases all, you know, these types of civil rights cases all over the country. Most of your police officers don't live in the inner city. They work there, but they live in the suburbs. They're not part of the community. They don't come to the community. In other words, you know, and some of them have testified in depositions I've taken that, that you know, to them, it's almost like, waking up in the morning, leaving the suburb, going to the war zone. And they're going with that mentality. It's us versus you. Um, and it's, um, I mean, um, and, and it, yeah. And so, again, how do you resolve it? Do you resolve it by this? When you see a police officer, when a police commits a crime, justice has to be served. Here's what the people are upset about. Because a lot of times in these cases, you have people say, well, you guys aren't talking about black on black crime. You're not talking about white on white crime. Why don't you talk about that? Every time the police kill somebody, you're upset. And see, the, one, that, that's a fallacy. There's no, there's, the reason why you got black on black crime is the same reason why you got white on white crime. The statistics from the FBI show that when we all live in, in neighborhoods together, we're more likely to kill each other than look like us, right? <laughs> so, but they'll say black on black. But here's the point. When we commit crimes, those people that are committing these crimes are brought to justice. They are charged with whatever crime for the most part. They're sentenced and can be enough to get a trial, and et cetera. The reason that you see the frustration here is because for so long, no one's brought to justice when, when they're wearing that badge and are killing our people. And that's the crime, right? Um, and, and that's the anger. It's almost like we can kill you with impunity. And so when you see people saying Black Lives Matter, what that is saying is this, for some reason you kill us and, and nobody cares, you're not charged with crimes. And sometimes when you're charged, you're not even convicted. Um, you know, no matter what the evidence is, people thought that with, with Rodney King, you know, when the videotape first came out, I was like, yeah, that's the, right? And you remember the riots erupted then when they were found not guilty, because what, what we said as a black community, well, you know, we've been telling you these things been going on for years. Finally, finally we got it on tape. Finally, we got some, see, now, now we can show you what we've been saying is real, right? And so now we're going to have a trial, and, and you're going to see, and justice will happen. And then it's like not guilty, even with it on tape. And so do our lives matter? And see, that's, that is part of what the anger comes out. And so when they say all lives matter, so people say, you know, all lives matter. And that becomes insulting because it's saying we really don't recognize that the issue and the statistics that show that you're killed at disproportion, disproportionate rate than any other race, and no one's bought the charges. It's almost like saying, yeah, 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 but all lives matter. And it's ignoring the real issue in the, in the community. Uh, so I'm sorry for rambling on. Well, it's okay. Uh, so I see three levels of, um, of, of groups here that are in the spotlight. Uh, one is, um, of course, the police. 
Two is um, uh, the justice system, the, the judges. And three is, uh, I suppose you could say the jurors to the extent they're involved. And you don't come up with a fair result. I mean, are all three, is there, is there something else? Are there, is there another group? It sounds like they're all somehow involved in this injustice, am I right? Well, I, I think, look at Trayvon Martin case and George Zimmerman. Now you got a teenage kid. Now th think about this, man. If a black man had followed a teenage kid from 7-Eleven that, that had just bought some Skittles and an iced tea and had accosted him and ended up killing him, right, um, that he would still be in jail. And so getting back to your point, a lot of these jurors, like Trayvon Martin's jurors were six white females. They, for some reason in, in Florida, you only need six instead of 12 on a jury. But you had six white females. And George Zimmerman saying, hey, there's a black guy that's attacking me. And had he continued to attack me, he was going to get... Now, Zimmerman had a gun, not Trayvon. Trayvon had Skittles and iced tea. Um, and so, again, I think it's that mindset that somehow is, is, is brought, in, brought into the jury system that, that, that we're, we're viewed as animals. And, that, and so if you can create an, an image of me in your mind that I'm an animal, it's, you're more it's okay for you to kill me, you know, you, right? And, and then a lot of times you have jurors weighing, especially if a defendant or a client, or, you know, I would have men that, that if they got shot and killed, some of them will have prior records. And so you got the police sitting there and some jurors are thinking in their mind, well, this guy was really out to try to help us. And so, it's, it, it, you know, should we ruin his life by convicting him when this guy is, you know, really just was a criminal? And had he just listened to the police, he'd still be here today. And you, you know, so a lot of that goes on in these cases. It's hard to convict a police officer. Mm -hmm. So how do you, uh, you, you were about to get into this a minute ago. How do you resolve this? What steps do you take? Is it, is it resolvable? And uh, what do you do and who does it? I just think that people have to understand that, you know, everybody should be subjected to the same level of law and be willing to, to enforce it that way. Again, um, you know, if, if you saw people can see the reason why it's continued, look, look at the Me Too movement. Once it came out that it was not okay for you to put your hand, you know, when you see Harvey Weinstein, when you see Bill Cosby, when you, right? And so all of a sudden, men can control their behavior. Right. You know why? Because you now you're held accountable for it. Now, if you do these things, you could be charged with, with rape because you're in a position of power and you're using that power to. to right. And so you, you're going to see less and less of it. Why? Because justice is being done. And, and so it doesn't matter. It's not about changing the mindset of the men and say, OK, I want you to view women differently. What the women are saying, we don't want to give a crap how you view us. You touch us. You, you use these positions of power. To, to rape us, you're going to prison. So you're going to see that stop. And the same type of attitude has to happen here. See, a lot of times after these shootings, people say, well, what can we do to understand the, the relationship in the black community better? I'm telling you right now, I'm at the point where I'm all out of Fs to give. I, my whole point is I really, you don't need to understand me any better. You really don't need to, to empathize with. What I need you to do is when you see somebody kill me and I'm unarmed, bring them to justice and make sure justice is served. That is stop it. Mm -hmm. That is stop it. Um, can you talk about the, uh, the protests? Can you talk about what happened there and, you know, the organic uh, nature of it and, uh, and yeah, how it got to be violent and what are the implications going forward? This is the biggest series of protests the country has ever seen. And it went international. Right, right. Um, you know, it, it's funny because when you watch a protest in Hong Kong, they freedom fighters, right? See, the United States look at them and say, hey, they fighting for freedom. And they over there burning stuff up, tearing stuff up, everything, right? But they freedom fighters. And I'm, I'm not for looting. I'm not. You know, when, when, when you know, when we, but, but what happened in Cincinnati was, so we would start off with peaceful marches and you would get uh, some people out there, some come in and they'll portray it for their own. They, they come out, they know they're going to come out and loot. Then you got others who lose their temper. They get uh, shot by a bullet, you know, one of those beanbag bullets. Back in when I was, they had these beanbags, they would shoot you 
Now they got the rubber bullets too. Well, they had those back then too. So you get shot, then they explode, right? Now it's, let's tear up the cars and stuff. Then you got others, you know, in Dr. King's image and follow that model of no matter what, they continue to move on. Um, and so I'm not for looting or anything like that. I, uh, but, but what I am saying is it's not uncommon. And, if, and, if, and to be honest, when Dr. King was killed and the riots went up, it only took six days to pass the Civil Rights Act. If you look, now everybody talks about, you know, what would you do and what would Dr. King do if he was here? Well, y'all killed him, so we don't know. Not all, you know what I mean, but you know what I mean? We don't know. Is been, well, what would Dr. King say about us if he was here? Well, I don't know, because he's dead. Somebody killed him. But six days after he died, remember? A lot of young people don't know that. But man, this 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 nation burnt up. That little burn, baby burn came out of that. Remember that? Out Detroit, LA. Six days later, the Civil Rights Act was passed. And all I'm saying is this: sometimes that loud noise gets stuff done. If you go back to Minnesota last week, they said, well, we're going to take our time. We want to do a thorough investigation. Then them people started, you know, um, raising hell. He was charged the next day. So, like I said, I don't want anybody getting understanding that I'm for looting or anything like that. So, you know, what I am saying, though, is like when we was in Cincinnati and, and the riots broke out four days, National Guard was called in. Um, it, it, it was able... What it did was big business put pressure on the local council and the mayor and the governor. And they said, you know, they're down here tearing up this stuff. Y'all got to do something. And so then everybody, then, then the mayor, the governor, the prosecutors, the police, everybody had to start listening because the community and our officials are so tied to business. And, and so, uh, and, and, and honest, honestly speaking, um, um that that got a reaction out of them mm -hmm. but like i said you got you got you got people on the right wing infiltrating you got you know there's video taste man of, of white people driving around ha passing out bricks that had nothing to do with the protests right now the trump and i'm saying they're from the far left i uh, forget the name of the group others are saying it's from the far right it doesn't matter some individual you know so i think all this goes on when you had this protest but it's at a heightened level now jay Trump, you say, you mentioned Trump. A lot of people are saying, Ken, that, uh, you know, Trump is responsible for um, accelerating, you know, throwing gasoline on, on the anger of the people in the streets and making it worse. So how do you feel about that? That's intentional. That's intentional, you know, because I think one, he wants a distraction from his, his pandemic, uh, from uh, just totally messing up the whole pandemic, right? So he needs a distraction. He, the economy's dying and he's trying to hold on by a thread. And I really do think, you know, if you, if uh, we just, you just came on the air, we both did, right? But a few minutes ago, uh, he had a press conference and right before the press conference, they started tear gas and peaceful protesters right outside the White House in order for him to have a press conference and do a photo op at the church right next, within walking distance to where he went out there and held up a Bible for, so they, they tear gas, innocent people. And here's a president or attacking his own citizens who are nonviolent and peacefully protesting. And it, I mean, this wasn't like last night. They were out there just peacefully protesting. They tear gassed them. They, they drove them back with horses. They attack, I mean, I've never seen a president attack his own nonviolent <clears throat> citizens in order to do a press out with a Bible. Hey, I'm telling you. So yeah, he's instigating it. Uh, he's he's throwing throwing it on the fire. We're a country divided. Um, you think you I, think a black community uh, understands, or um, do you think the black community um, appreciates what he is doing and not doing in terms no. of this protest? I, I I think this, and that's you know, I have a very large following on social media, and so I you know uh, I've been so consumed with this, but I've been trying to educate um, the community, the black community, and and, and on the mainland, that you have to really um, be aware of a lot of these uh, people that are going into these protests who are from the far right, who are trying to instigate, who are trying to start a race war. 
Um, I think that you know you go back and look at when the, when the people overtook the state capital in Michigan. Trump instigated that, right? And then he's gonna tell the governor, you know, you should meet with those people. Those are nice people standing out there with, with automatic weapons. And then he <laughs> runs down into the bunker yesterday, right? People yeah. standing outside the White House, and he, you know, they're like, knock, knock, we're here at your house now. And now he's running into the bunker. Hey man. <laughs> So Ken, what, what, what are your expectations here? This is obviously still in, in play. It's still in process. It's not over. Um, and who knows what will happen? Do you have an expectation, a, a prediction? Well, I, I think it would help if they would arrest the other officers. Like I said, I'm telling you, man, I've done, I've done criminal law for years. I teach it. And I've done these cases on a civil land for years. You do not need you can arrest people right now and investigate. These officers who haven't been arrested yet are sitting at home and they're investigating. What's the difference between that and you sitting your ass in jail while we do the invest? There is none, right? And so you can charge um, and then up the charge, do another indictment. We saw that with Catherine K. Aloha, you know, just for, for context. Remember, she kept getting indicted over and over again because things kept changing. And that's not uh, unusual. And so I think if they arrested the individuals, that would help calm things down. Mm, yeah. uh, so what, what uh, if anything, I mean, we're not, as I say, we're not finished with this. It's still in, in process, but is it too early to, to learn anything from it? I mean, what, what lessons, at least so far, would you draw from the events that have taken place over the past few days? We need leadership. We need leadership, man. Now, you know, as well as I do, a, a, a president that was uh, truly leading this country would, would, would have sat down uh, and done one of those fireside chats. I mean, you know, Trump could have came out the bunker and did a different type of fireside chat last <laughs> night. <laughs> he would have gave, gave it new meaning. But, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, but really, because, see, this is a time where a true leader could say, look, you know what, this, and, and acknowledge the pain. You know, and, and, and all, that's all that has to happen. Look, we are a country that, that can still stay together. We've been through slavery. We've been through Reconstruction. We've been through all Civil War, all this stuff, right? And so we can somehow try to unite. But that, that cannot come unless we recognize and respect one another. But why, you know, I'm telling you, man, this guy is dangerous. This guy being the president, he's dangerous, man. Yeah. Ken Lawson. I'm the faculty of uh, UH Manoa William S. Richardson School of Law. Thank you so much for joining us, Ken. Thanks Great for having to me, talk brother. to you. Great to have your input and to appreciate how you feel. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so for much. all you do, Jay. Thank you. Aloha.